This conference will now be recorded. So, it's like my neighbors are doing some vacuum cleaning. It's a uh, tough timing. So I'm going to share my screen here. I don't want to do all the teaching on this video. I'm just going to kind of explain what this class is about. Um, so the concept here is that oil and gas um, in particular, but industrials in general, store tons of data in Excel. And sometimes they're like small data sets like this one, it's only like 200 um, rows, but often they're bigger and definitely the percentage of data that is in Excel is actually growing and the total percentage is something like 90%. So tons and tons of data in Excel. And there's a burgeoning interest in data science techniques. There's some paper, there's an interesting MIT paper that showed that for quite a while, the status quo in the energy industry in oil and gas was to rely on linear regression to kind of figure out what works and what doesn't work. And um, coming out of the oil industry, I know that there certainly are a lot more sophisticated methods that people use, but that said, the data science uh, methods that have emerged from the data science community, from academia, from software industry, um, a lot of those best practices have yet to be uh, really integrated into workflows in oil and gas. So great opportunity there, especially as the industry is struggling for operational efficiencies. In addition, like I was saying, this isn't just oil and gas. There are tons of other industries uh, whether they're industrials doing things like manufacturing or chemicals or uh, whether they're other more kind of incumbent traditional industries like finance uh, or banking or real estate um, that store and use a lot of data in Excel. And one of the challenges of getting people to use data science is that a lot of the classes that teach data science are like, oh yeah, this class is taught in Octave and you learn a ton about you know data science best practices and methodologies. But everyone's worried about having to learn octave while they're learning data science at the same time uh, and so there's the fewer people who kind of sign up than there would be otherwise same with python and a lot of these other programs whereas um, in excel there are tons and tons of uh, people with a lot of experience here so if you already know how to use excel and you've done a little bit of scripting in visual basic or even if you haven't Learning about how data science works, starting off with Excel, is a good idea. And then you start to learn a, about where you bump up against walls in Excel and why it's a good idea to switch to something else. And because you know the concept, then you're, you have a clearer goal in mind when you start to build something in another tool uh, or another scripting language. Or when you're using another tool that was already built in another scripting language, you kind of trust it more. It's a bit more transparent for you. So that's kind of like the goal here is teach people data science methodologies. In particular, random forest, that's a nice, powerful and widely uh, applicable one. And then um, steer people towards an understanding of how different data management and manipulation uh, tools have different advantages and disadvantages. So this um, is just an Excel spreadsheet. and. We've got some data here, and this is just an example uh, data. So these are different wells, like oil wells, and the performance has been boiled down into a single number. So this well lost money. This well kind of broke even. Here's a well that did pretty well, um, a well performing well. So this is the location and the depth of the well. And because these are onshore unconventional wells, they're drilled down in the horizontal. And so this is the length of the horizontal part after we reach the depth of the well it's uh, drilled to. And then this is the configuration. There's a lot more behind this number, but I'm not allowed to share it. So uh, this data um, matters because we wanna, we wanna compile based on previous performance, what could matter in terms of performance going forward. And if we're going to pick another well in Lakeside, how should we configure it? And what should be its depth and lateral length? 
So to make those kinds of determinations, we want to apply some data science methodologies to this. This is a very simple use case. A random forest might even be kind of overkill. So this is the tool that people learn how to build. And what's cool about Excel here is that when you build here, I'm going to delete these trees and build some new ones. When you build uh, uh, trees for random forests in Excel, it's possible to build it such that nothing is stored in an array. Everything is stored actually on the Excel spreadsheet, which means it's very visual. So that's why it's called the forest visualizer, because you can build like one tree at a time. And as it's building, you can kind of like look at how how it works and why things have worked out the way they have, which is you know, helpful for debugging, but also for understanding um, really what's going on behind the scenes. So if I want to create a tree, I can choose what percent of the data and then hit go. So this is like the most basic thing. Let's just do 15%. Uh, so we can watch it build and uh, we can also like pause this visualization here. What it's doing is for each uh, feature of each sample, it's turned all of those features into numbers. And then it's going through and it's trying to minimize the R squared value if we were to take that feature of that sample and make it a split point um, in like a decision tree. Um, so the uh the it'll make a split and you know of course in the actual course i'll spend a lot of time explaining about r squared and the intuition behind r squared and how really what it is is just a comparison of the performance of any model to describe data versus the most naive model which is let's predict the average value for every single thing um, so I just like hit run. If you go into the developer tab, you can choose to put breakpoints. And so you can like trace back everything that's happening here. And when you do that, you get kind of a, a better sense, like uh, if there's any part of this that you're not understanding, you can pause and check. So the plan is to um, walk people through exercises. So here's, some exercises, like you're meant to use VBA to copy hello world from this to this. And I teach people, and it actually goes really fast, even if you don't have scripting experience, to teach people how to find hello world here using Visual Basic, um, like reference a sheet and then put it here. And similarly, um, so there's more tabs here that kind of like walk you through the basics of the coding that has to take place in order to enable this tool to work. And uh, I'm going to do a quick control alt delete here so I can look at the task manager. Oh, okay, it's done. Dang it. Um, I wanted to see how much of my compute power was being used um, by this. So I just made one tree, and that took a while, I think, because GoToMeeting is eating up a lot of my um, compute power here. So if I zoom out, this is a tree. and you can follow along the path. Uh, so it shows sample four, feature four as the first. So here's sample four, one, two, three, feature four was a two. You notice here that all of these values in their feature four area have a value that's greater than two. And all of these have either a one or a two because feature four, we'll remember, was the configuration. So a one is an A, a two is a B. C. So if I go into this tree, I see that I've split based on sample one feature four, which was this two value. So anything with a value that's greater than two in feature four goes here. Anything equal to or less goes here. Um, kind of going fast just to kind of save time because I'm making this video for the people who are running ODSC, not for students. Uh, the next split, we found a leaf on the tree, and that was sample four feature three from this branch. So sample one, two, three, four, feature three here. Um, and we go on from there. So this was the only 10. And we notice it had a uh, an actual performance value of 10. So interesting, we're starting to like zoom in on what works well. 
Similarly, we notice that the forest is performing pretty well here because there are a few tens down here. Those are high performing wells, but all of these are 10 or above. So we're finding the opportune areas to make decision tree splits. Uh, and we continue along in this way and all the way until the end. So I've, I've chosen, I said that there are other uh, hyperparameters and there's other things that we can, we can tweak here. And this is just a simple one, but we can click on create multiple trees and create multiple trees all at once. Um, and then of course there's the using the forest to actually make predictions about wells. So this data has been simplified just for teaching purposes, but then we can actually grab a real data set from Kaggle and throw this tool at it. And it takes a little while, like that took, geez, like, I don't know, two minutes to make a single tree. It was just 15% of, uh, of 200 here. So it's only like 30 um, samples and it took a while. Normally it goes really fast because uh, screen update, you can turn off so that it's not like going through and showing you like, thing that it's doing and trying to like use compute power to update the screen and, sh and show you what's happening in Excel. But I elected to turn that on just because I thought it'd be interesting um, on the video to, to kind of demonstrate why Excel might be a good tool to help people learn this, especially if they're already used to Excel and rows and columns and references and equations and things like that. So yeah, just a, a couple more things to zoom in on here. Uh, I teach people how to pull up um, visual basic and then like open up exercises in here. So, and there's already some things that are like, um, coded for them. So they can get a sense of how the, uh, like this is a nice built in function where you can just represent, uh, or you can reference a cell. So if you type in three, four, it'll grab the value of from the first sheet. Um, cell that's the third row and the fourth column. And then so people can kind of learn about how to paste it. And from there you move on into like uh, pro gradually, progressively more advanced. So here we have like uh, a random number in here. And as you enter things, you can see that it's a random number. Um, sometimes because it'll pick either zero or one and that's just a cute thing to help people figure out about um okay so i need to take this value here and if it's zero i say that it's zero and if it's one i say that it's one and so you can check your code by like having this thing kind of randomly bounce between zero and one so that learns about conditional if statements and then we learn about four loops um in this one we learn about uh keeping a counter going with a for loop, this one. Then we start to learn about while loops and if statements inside of while loops. And that's kind of all you need actually for a random forest. That and the, um, the math and intuition behind the random forest itself, which is kind of like quick to explain and fun. And then people wind up with this tool, which they can bring to their workplace. This tool, people can bring to their workplace and uh, show uh show each other you know to help stimulate some interest in data science but also just apply to data on the job and so this isn't the first time i've done this i've taught inside of oil companies um this same course and it's gone pretty well uh a week from yesterday i will be teaching uh, about 30 people through the american association of petroleum geologists this course and one of the reasons I want to do this at ODSC is I want to attract people to the conference who aren't already like um, great data scientists, but people who are interested in becoming data scientists and make something like good for them. But I also think that if you are already in the data science world and you're really good at this stuff already, it helps for you if you're if you want to be even more employable. It helps for you to be able to execute what you're doing in the the tools that other people are already like using. There are so many different companies out there that do not allow their employees to use Python. Sorry, not allowed. They're like, oh well, I'm gonna you know reference something from GitHub. Well, you don't have access to that website. 
you know, I'm just going to watch this YouTube video about how to know you don't have access to that. Either. And maybe that's starting to change and maybe COVID-19 will accelerate the uh, liberalization of workflow inside of incumbent industries. But there's still a challenge that like all of this data is in Excel. So data scientists like start to get good at referencing Excel and understand how Excel works. Uh, I work with some people who are fresh graduates from data science programs and their ex Excel skills are actually pretty low um, because it's just considered an obsolete tool. And objectively, perhaps that's correct, you know, but you can also measure a tool's obsolescence by uh, not just by its performance uh, and its efficiency in handling tasks that are relevant to create value. You can also measure its obsolescence by how much it actually is used and how much information that needs to be accessed and used is stored in that tool. And if you can sit, if you widen the scope of obsolescence to include that, Excel goes from being super obsolete to being like a lot less obsolete here. So those are the those are the goals, and this is the course. Uh, there's a GitHub repo with some of this stuff on it, um, so that you know people who attend the course can follow up and. Uh, I've shared that repo in this application. So I hope that this is all clear and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I'm a big fan of ODSC and uh, I would like to create an ODSC chapter in Houston, Houston, Texas, where the demand for this kind of stuff is really burgeoning and I think there'd be a lot of interest to be a big hit of a conference right away once um, in-person conferences kind of come back. So I'm gonna end my video there. This video is meant to be about this class and my application to teach it at ODSC, um, not necessarily about bringing ODSC to Houston. But uh, in case somebody who watches this checks that out, um, I would like to talk more about it. So, all right, thanks for your time.